Next up, welcome Bob Vanderplatz. Well, good afternoon. I got to tell you, I was so impressed with the last two panels. And for James not being a Christian, but he's definitely searching. I think he's well on his way. Uh, and when I heard Jack Hibbs, when Jack Hibbs got done, I thought, I don't even need to talk today. Did he knock it out of the park or what? Well, Charlie Kirk had me on his podcast after the overturn of Roe v. Wade, and, and when we got done, he said, Bob, would you be willing to come out to San Diego and speak at our inaugural TPUSA faith event? And I said, where is it? He said, San Diego. Matter of fact, it's Coronado Island. I said, well, in Iowa, we get three days like this a year, so I will come on out to San Diego and thrilled to be here. I'm going to come at it from a state perspective, and I want you to look at it through that lens. We're going to localize things a little bit, and I hope to leave you with some hope because there are some great things happening in this country state by state by state. Matter of fact, a former governor of California decided to run for president. 1979, it was Ronald Reagan. And when Ronald Reagan launched his bid to run for president, he said this. He said, I believe this country hungers and thirsts for a spiritual revival. Guys, that was 1979. Think about where we're at in 2022. We don't know if it's a boy or a girl. We don't know what restroom to use. Things that once were right are now considered wrong, and things that are wrong are now celebrated as right. And I believe in 2022, this country hungers and thirsts for a spiritual revival, and nothing else and no one else will do. It has to begin there. And so what we say, when you take a look at Washington, D.C., and things are just running amok like crazy, and we can tell intuitively that things aren't right. What we need to remind ourselves is our hope was never designed to be in Washington, D.C. That is not where our hope was supposed to be. Jesus didn't believe our hope was supposed to be there. And the founders of this country did not believe our hope should be in Washington, D.C. So what we tell people all the time in our ministry called the family leader is we tell them these three things. If you don't remember anything else of my remarks today, I hope you remember these three things as pastors of the local church. One is when you see things running, running amok, we say, look higher. Look higher. Psalm 121, David looks to the hills in the city of Jerusalem. And when he looks at the hills, he says, where does my help come from? It comes from the Republican Party. No. It comes from this candidate or that candidate or this policy or that. No. He basically says, look way higher. My help comes from the Lord. So one is we say, look higher. Two is we say, think bigger. Think bigger, and think bigger is where Jesus is foretelling for, for what's going to happen to him. He's going to get captured. He's going to get tortured. They're going to flog him. They're going to bring him to the cross. You remember Peter at that time? Peter intervenes, and he says, no, 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 that's not going to happen. We got a good thing going here, Jesus. Do you see the miracles you're performing? Do you see the crowds that you're attracting? And Peter wasn't, you know, without knowing that he had a, in a front row seat. He, he had a seat at the table. We're going to overtake Rome. And Jesus said to Peter, get behind me. Get behind me, Satan. You're thinking way too small. Jesus in that vernacular would have said, think bigger, Peter. 
Keep your focus on the eternal, not on the earthly. And the third thing we say is we say, look higher, think bigger. The third thing we say is expect more. Expect way more. This is John 10, 10. He came to give life and to give it abundantly now. So we as believers, never should we be the ones who are downcast and downtrodden and full of despair, the hee-haw song. That should never be us. Why? Because that's not where our hope is intended to be. We're going to look higher. We're going to think bigger. And we're going to expect way, way more. And we believe the hope is in the bride of Christ, his church. Matter of fact, you'll see up there on the top of the screen, it says, inspiring the church to engage government for the advancement of God's kingdom, for the advancement of the kingdom. Not for a party, not for a candidate, but for the advancement of the kingdom. And what we have seen in the state of Iowa and now 15 other states, it's turning, thing, every, it's turning everything upside down or right side up. So how would America be transformed if the shepherds of God's church the senior pastors, you can't delegate this one. How would America be transformed if the senior pastors had an intentional relationship with the shepherds of government? The shepherds of the church with the shepherds of government. The state legislator, the state representative, the state senator, the state's governor, the U.S. senator, the U.S. congressman and woman. How would it be different if there was an intentional relationship? Think Nathan to David. Why could Nathan tell David, you're the man? Because there is a relationship there. How would America be transformed if that's happening state after state? How would America be transformed if the state's leader, the governor, in this case, Governor Reynolds, built such a trust with that church network that she would open up all 36 departments for the word of God to penetrate through to break bondage. How would that transform a country if that was happening in state after state after state? How would America be transformed if every rotunda was filled on occasion with praise and worship and prayer from both sides of the aisle in the name of Jesus Christ? How would America be transformed if we saw civic engagement as biblical stewardship. We tell churches all the time, and that's what Jack Hibbs was trying to say up here. We tell churches all the time, we don't need you to be political. But doggone it, we need you to be biblical, and we need you to be culturally relevant. Because that will transform a country. If we view it as civic engagement, as biblical stewardship, it will change everything. And make no mistake about it, Hebrews 2 verse 1 says, be careful that you do not drift from what you have heard. And ladies and gentlemen, I'd argue today, we're not just drifting away from the heart of God, but we are in a dead sprint away from the heart of God. And that girl that we have picture of there, that could be your daughter, it could be your granddaughter. But Satan's got the crosshairs on the kids. I was in education before I went into ministry. So kids are near and dear to my heart. This is the target, the next generation. And so what it is, as parents, what did we do with the kids? We taught the kids how to build bigger barns. How to live one foot in the church world and live one foot in everything America has to offer. Build bigger barns, build bigger barns. You ever heard of that before? The book of Judges? And while we were teaching the kids how to build bigger barns, there was four guys who were developing what they called the blueprint of how they were going to transform this country. And what it was going to do was going to go to socialism. And I put Bernie Sanders there because when Bernie Sanders comes to Iowa, because he still believes he's going to be president one day. But think about this. 
Bernie Sanders is old. He looks disheveled. And yet he'll have 5,000 people, 5,000 young people who will show up to listen at one of his rallies in the state of Iowa. Why? It's not because of who he is, but it's because of what he's selling. And he's selling that this country should go to socialism, which is about redistribution. It's about taking what is yours and making it mine, and I get to redistri redistribute it on my terms. Guys, that's the heart of socialism. And as we as the church need to know and understand about socialism, socialism says government is God. And everyone gets to do what's right in their own eyes. And that is the fundamental question we have today. And when government becomes God and you replace God, guess what you get? Chaos and division. We live in some of the most divided times ever today. A Thanksgiving dinner can be divided. Wherever you go, there seems to be chaos. There seems to be division. Why? Because we're running away from God's created order. And you have a whole culture saying, where is the hope? Now, there's a lot of things that happened on January 6th. And what, it, what happened was we ran from people trusting the integrity of an election. Remember, our God's a God of integrity. Our God's a God of order. But I got to tell you, when I was in Scottsdale, Arizona, and January 6th was taking place, and I saw the rush into the Capitol, I thought, that's where our hope is. That's where we've placed our hope. And that's where I started thinking about us as a ministry again. Look higher. Think bigger. Expect way, way more. And so what we did is we, re we revamped our model. You guys remember 2012 election? In 2012, you had a guy by the name of Barack Obama, Obama run for re-election, and Mitt Romney was his opponent. You guys remember this election? As a matter of fact, in 2012, they were telling us this is the most important election of our lifetime. Every two years, it is the most important election of our lifetime. And we went all in, all in for the most important election of our lifetime. And on that particular night, we got kicked at the ballot box. Not just the presidential election, but marijuana being passed, same-sex marriage being passed. It was a gut punch. And after we lost, Darla and I did what good Iowa Dutch people do, is we fled for the mountains. And we went to Colorado Springs. And while we're in Colorado Springs, Dr. Dobson and I are good friends. I text him, said, are you around? He said, yeah, I'd love to talk to you. So we went to the office. And I walked into Dr. Dobson's office and I said, now what are we going to do? And he looked at me and he said, Bob, that was my question for you. He said, because everything I gave my life to last night or this past election just took a hit. You see, because we used to be so focused on policy. We want righteous and just policy, and that's a good thing. And that's what we were focused on. But then we decided it's who we elect that determines our policy, right? But then are you with me that once in a while you elect somebody and they let you down? I mean, what happened? They were pro-life at the chicken dinner. But then they got to the state capitol or to D.C., and now they're not. They knew what marriage was at the county fundraiser. But then they got to the state capitol in D.C., now they don't know what marriage is. We've got that going on right now, guys. And so people we elect let us down. And then we said, you know what? Politics is downstream from culture. Until we authentically engage the bride of Christ, not hijack the bride of Christ, authentically engage the bride of Christ in its mission. The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Cry out to the Lord of the harvest, send more laborers. 
And we said, you know what we're going to do is we're going to get into the shepherd to shepherd thing. It's going to be about the gospel. It's going to be anchoring in prayer. We're bringing the shepherds of the church and the shepherds of government together. We're going to partner together, not just in prayer, but actually in delivering on your role as a shepherd of government because it's God's institution. And when you infiltrate the shepherds of God's church to the shepherds of God's government, pretty soon they understand elections matter. And pretty soon they want to elect ministers of God. Let me pause for a second. If you run for public office and you get elected, it's one of the highest callings in the scripture. You are a minister of God. And we as the church, we as believers, for sure you as senior, senior pastors and shepherds, we should never lower the bar for those serving in public office of being less than a minister of God. They have a high calling. Do not be disqualified for the prize. Do not attach your testimony to a candidate or to a politician. But be a Nathan to a David and hold them to a higher standard. That's what our job is to be. It's not about the coveted seat at the table. But then they go all into it like ministers of God. And then you know what? Then we advance righteous policy. The reason we say end abortion, how does God grant revival to a country where we still kill the babies? And I'm thrilled to be up here today to say, you know what? Roe v. Wade is overturned. That's great, but abortion has not ended. We need the church to be the church bigger than life today on that issue, but then we want to see a biblical model of partnership between the church and government, two of God's institutions. Why? Because the government can cut a check. The government can see data that's macro. The church is there with the gospel that can set the captive free. The church is there that sees the micro, the one that's in the ICU, the one that they're burying, the, the, empty, the empty chair at the table. We need to have a biblical partnership. And I'm telling you what, if that took place in every state in this country, you would change the country. And if you change the country, you would change the world. And it works. I, in Iowa alone, 2,700 pastors, 2,200 churches. Every day the legislature is in session, we have pastors at the Capitol. Not hundreds at a time, but more like 10, 12, 18 at a time. So for four months of the year, pastors are infiltrating with the Word of God, different rotating pastors coming in to the Capitol, bringing the Word of God, meeting with the shepherds of government, First, as a person, how are you doing? How's your walk with the Lord? How's your marriage? And we do this with Republicans and Democrats. And then we speak into it first as a person, but then we speak into him as a shepherd. Because we believe, as Jack Hibbs says, God's word speaks to everything. And they have an important role to fulfill. So we speak into them as a shepherd. And then finally, we look for ways that we can partner on foster care, on pornography, on the COVID crisis, on whatever it might be. How can we become partners in this deal? Guys, that's a biblical model, and it works. You'll see here, in Iowa, we took out three Supreme Court judges because of an engaged church. Three Supreme Court judges that thought they had the right to redefine the institution of marriage without the vote of the people of Iowa. And we said, you guys went outside of your constitutional boundaries and it happens to be outside your biblical boundaries, and we held them accountable and were the only state in the country to oust three Supreme Court judges because of what they did to marriage. But we did that because of an inspired church. We've gone three for three in the Iowa caucuses in winners. They were all come from behind wins because of an inspired church. Matter of fact, the last one where you see Cruz, Cruz was supposed to get beat by five. He won by four. It was a nine-point turnaround. We asked the Bloomberg News pollster, Ann Seltzer, who's a respected pollster, what happened? She was, I never thought I would see 
the church turn out the way the church turned out. Why? Because they'll invade elections when that happens. The other results there, Kim Reynolds at top there, she is signing the heartbeat bill in the state of Iowa, one of the first states in the country to sign in heartbeat bill. After that, Governor Reynolds, the, Tuesday, the Sunday before the Tuesday, she's running for re-election. She's one of the best governors in the country. She's ahead of us on most of the issues. She texted me on the Sunday, the poll had her down by three. She was going to lose to a businessman from Des Moines who's the Planned Parenthood chair. And she goes, Bob, we need your network to show up. The pollsters didn't get that one right either. Governor Reynolds won re-election by three points. She didn't lose it by three points. And she's the one heck of a leader. And we're thrilled because she acts as a minister of God. Matter of fact, in 2020, Donald Trump and Joni Ernst were in toss-up races in Iowa. Trump won by nine. Joni won by six, an inspired church. Barna will tell you that less than 10% of the churches are willing to engage politically. In our network, over 55% of them are engaging with, because it's, about, it's biblical. It's not political. Matter of fact, the largest church in Iowa <coughs> excuse me, is about 30,000 people. They gave our talking point sermon before the election. Because it wasn't about politics, but it was about the church being the timeless voice to a culture, a prophetic voice to a culture. And what that did is that mobilized people out of the pews. You can impact elections and make a difference. Let me stop here real quick because I missed it. To be part of our church network, you need to believe in the inerrancy of God's word. And you need to believe that Jesus is the way, not a way. In Iowa, you just lost over 50% of the churches. And I guarantee in your state it's the same way. Probably more. So many of them have become social clubs with a cross. But God has, is using a remnant. In Iowa, 2,700 pastors, 2,200 churches. It's, it's, it's making Iowa an unbelievable state. The spiritual temperature is at an all-time high. And I'd argue if he had those numbers in California, you would start changing California as well. So the engaged church, why is it working? Because the American founders were right when they said the power's in the states. When you watch Fox News or whatever you watch and you go, I can't believe D.C., fix your state. The state is where it's at. The founders believed it. Tip O'Neill was right. Democrat Speaker of the House. All politics is local. And we believe Jesus Christ was right. Upon this rock, I'll build my church. And the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Guys, that's an offensive statement. That's not a defensive statement. Jesus now is on offense. So we look to engage his bride of Christ. Why is it working? It's built on trust. This isn't coming in, fly into a state, fly out of a state. This is building relationships. We have teams in every one of the states that we're engaged in who are working with the pastors. They know them by name. It's not just a database. So it's built on trust with the pastors, with the shepherds of God's government. Governor Reynolds says about the Daniel Impact, which is this initiative, she wants to see it in all 50 states because what she sees doing to Iowa. We had a, a Blaze TV host who was speaking in Texas. He's from Iowa. He said, do you understand right now that Iowa is more red than Texas? And there's only one, one reason why, because of an inspired church implementing a biblical model. So right now the Daniel Impact's in 15 states. We try to go into strategic states, Ohio and Minnesota and Wisconsin, New Hampshire and Indiana and Pennsylvania, Florida, Arizona, Texas, Kansas, and now just recently Delaware and we just, lost, or we just launched Virginia. But the goal is to be in 24 by 24. Those are 40 po policy alliance states. These are the states that we team with, but we want to have this model in 24 states by the year 2024. And we're really hoping one day that we're in all 50. Because guys, when you do this the right way, you can put your head on the pillow at night 
you remain true to the gospel. You keep things in the right order. It's the gospel, baby. It's the only thing that will do. And revival begins in the house of the Lord. It's anchored in prayer. But now we're going to bring the shepherds of the church together with the shepherds of government. And we're going to impact elections like never before. We're going to advance righteous and just policy like never before. And we're going to showcase a biblical partnership like never before. How fast can we get there? We move at the speed of relationships. So this isn't, again, this isn't just a database. So we go at the speed of relationships. We go at the speed of talent. Talent matters. If you don't believe me that talent matters, ask the Tampa Bay Buccaneers if talent matters. It matters. And we go at the speed of resources. But guys, right now, we've got our peer in California right here clamoring to become part of the Daniel Impact saying this will work in California. I'm telling you what, in California, if you bring the shepherds of the church with the shepherds of government, Republican and Democrat, even Governor Newsom, we believe the word of God will not leave void. You need to have the meetings. If you're a senior pastor here, but you don't have a relationship with a government official, you have to ask yourself, why not? Matter of fact, we've been told by donors, don't worry about California. And Greg Baker, our vice president, church ambassador, network director in Iowa said, you mean we're, we're not going to worry about 49 million souls? And he said, do you understand that if we, if we change California, you change the, tra the trajectory of the country? So we're going all in. Darla and I have been blessed with four boys. This isn't Darla, this is just some made-up picture. But Darla and I have been blessed with four boys. As we're implementing this model, and we get, we get a lot of press, and we get on a lot of TV and a lot of news and all that stuff because of what we do in politics, because we move numbers. Because when we go in, we go in to win. We don't, put, we don't play around. We go in to win, but we do it the right way where we're not disqualified for the prize. We always hold on to our testimony. You can do yes and. You can walk and chew gum at the same time. But Darla said to me, she said, Bob, if it's all about winning an election and we lose the next generation, she goes, count me out. But I'm telling you, with this model, you can impact an election while you win a generation. They will see you be in the hands and feet of Jesus Christ and actually meeting the needs. And if you think it doesn't work, we had two Republicans come to know the Lord, and we had two Democrats come to know the Lord. Guys, this is a mission field like none other. Now, end with this, and this will be my challenge to you. My dad served in World War II, and they called that generation the greatest generation. He was MC in a Memorial Day service in our little town of Sheldon, Iowa, and the high school band was back there. And he said to the high school band, he said, you know, they call us the greatest generation. He said, but don't ever let it be said of this country that the greatest generation lived, but they died, and they're buried. He said, every generation needs to rise up and they need to choose to be a great generation. They stood in the gap against a ruthless dictator. I believe we have a fiercer enemy because the enemy is from within. And the enemy is demonic. This is spiritual warfare. But right now, we need the church to rise up like never before. Hold on to the word of God. Be unapologetic with the gospel and stand up for righteous and just policy and elect ministers of God. And I believe you can win elections while winning the next generation. There are good days ahead for our country, but it's going to happen in the states 
anchored by the bride of Christ, his church. Thank you so much. Thank you.